Hello again. This is a Generating Quest for Outlands. I'm going to give you a, a demo of that uh, Generating Quest booklet, uh, how you actually use a deck of tarot cards to generate quests for a fantasy adventure. Now the uh, quests were actually, the booklet is, is used with uh, Chronicles of the Outlands, which is a, a Viking um, a motif game uh, set in the uh, fall of the Eastern Roman Empire probably around 800 AD, but the specifics are not that important. It's uh, the Black Sea and the Baltic Sea connected by the rivers between. You can see my character down here. He's in Constantinople, the capital, and I'm starting at level zero, and I'm gonna get my first mission as a first player of the game. Now what's uh, nice about this system is the fact that it can actually be generated on the fly in a quick amount of time. What you're gonna need is you're going to need a patron, a quest, and the patron's reason. You're going to need a political faction that's most affected by the mission. You're going to need the finances that the patron has, any twists along the way, and a rival and whatever flare forces the rival has. So what exactly are these things? Well, the patron is your benefactor. He's the person that seeks you out. He's your employer. He's the person that wants you to do something. Now, the patron also have his own individual quirks or an actual de uh, um, um, extra added depth that's generated by the deck of cards, depending upon when the flips are coming up. Uh, you have the quest itself, which is going to be the heart of your adventure. It's the task that uh, the patron wants you to complete. But then the patron also has his own motive, and that motive, his reason, might be a secret. He may have ulterior motives that uh, don't readily uh, seem apparent. And also, the quest itself will affect the greater campaign. Something you do in uh, Constantinople could affect uh, um, Kiev, and uh, that outcome may be good or bad for the players. They may not even know at the time. They may start as uh, a low-level characters doing something that affects the outcome in, in Chernovgra, and uh, not, uh, not realize that later in life that uh, that would come back to, uh, to haunt them later. So. Uh, there's going to be the finances the patron has, and as I said, there's a political faction in uh, in my campaign. There's probably close to 40 political factions that can be affected, and, and it's it's a big balancing game as one uh, faction gains power, another one is obviously losing it. Um, twists. Now, all of the adventures that I run use travel encounters. Now, the travel encounters are all totally random, although totally random is probably the wrong thing to say because if you use the encounter system along with this uh, mission generation system the encounters relate back into the mission itself and you can get modifiers along the way uh, but twists would be something that uh, would definitely uh, be something that could be kept secret by the referee and be sprung on the players as they journey the rival himself may not be known but over the course of the adventure more and more of the players will start to realize who's opposed to this quest and it may be one of their own fa uh, friends as they get uh, higher in level although that's less likely P uh, the people are more intuitive and they start to have their own alliances so let's see how this works so if i go over to the game booklet itself and i scroll down just a bit i get into the table of contents here and with the table of contents i can see that i can generate uh, I can generate my uh, my patrons, and I can generate the missions and optional missions if I want the missions to go into the underworld rather than be above ground. Uh, certainly, above ground missions can take you into the underworld, but these are specific uh, dungeon crawl type of adventures. And as I said, you have the motives. So the first thing I'll do is I'll just flip a card, uh, three of coins. You know click on the three of coins and scroll down a bit. You can see the amount of material here with uh, uh, 78 cards in the tarot deck. Um, this booklet is very encyclopedic. Uh, I do not want to run out of ideas. And as you get 78 cards of patrons times 78 cards of quests times 78 cards of twists, you're never going to ever see the same quest twice. And uh, each quest is going to have its own unique uh, uh, properties. And for most people running a campaign over the year, they may generate 50 quests, and they're not even going to see a, a, a specific quest or motive. Uh, it's unlikely that those will even repeat. So we have an ear to fortune. Let me, uh, let me clip that out. The card is not inverted. So you can see that. An inverted card would be actually upside down as opposed to uh, right side up. Let me uh, cut and paste and go back to Epic Table. Let me uh, handle the disclaimers while I'm here. And I'm using Epic Table as a virtual laptop. Uh, 
uh, virtual uh, tabletop so that I can uh, use it for recording. Uh, Skype, you can see in the corner, I'm using for voice and for my visuals. And uh, the, the uh, music in the background is, uh, is Data Becker, um, uh, royalty free. I also have a uh, Tarot of the Vikings that I'm using as my visual aid. And uh, all of this stuff can be acquired online. So we have an heir to fortune, a person who one day will inherit great riches and lands, but for the moment is without money. Do not pick a finance card unless the players speed along the process of his inheritance. So there's a little bit of a twist there. So the players are being asked to do a job, but they're not necessarily going to be paid up front for it. So the heir to fortune is saying, well, one day I'm going to be a great man, but right now I'm sort of a weak man. And the heir will want to come along on the quest and journey, uh, and he cannot be dissuaded from that task. So this is also a coming of age. So this is probably a younger patron. I could call him uh, Roger, uh, which would uh, match the motif. And Roger wants us to come along on the, on the quest. And uh, what does he want us to do? So all I have to do is flip another card. And I get the Eight of Swords, but it's also inverted. So I go back to my booklet here. And I scroll up a little bit. Now a lot of these... Uh, a lot of these tables also have quick look tables, so that you can, if you uh, if you have those quick look tables in front of you, you can flip your cards out and get an idea. Well, you know, I don't really want the bandits to be this time. Maybe I want it to be a widow, but I tend to let the cards be the cards as I'm flipping my own quest. But what does that eight of swords do? And I'm going to use a regular quest here. I won't specifically make it in the underworld. And I go to missions of swords and I scroll on down. And eventually I'll get to that Eight of Swords, and the Eight of Swords will tell me, and it's inverted, so I'm going to take the inverted here. Since the uh, inverted sometimes is a modifier to the main quest, I'll just grab them both and stick them both in chat here. And so the mission is conduct a personal quest, a chance to right a past wrong. So uh, Roger, our young heir, has done something in his past that he regrets, regrets now. I select a personal quest and secondary motive, apply it to the mission here. It's inverted. All the players should start this mission with the alternate characters, then one by one their main characters enter the play. Well, that's interesting. So I usually play with the characters having a stable of characters. That way, if they get injured in the game, they can drop out. Or, since they're actually traveling a longboat with a huge crew, they're going to have a number of different roles they may play over the course of their adventure. So the players would need to start perhaps with a higher level alternate character and go to a lower one, or in this case may be suggested that they need to start with a lower level hireling, a lower level character, even roll new characters, but somewhere along the mission events will have to take place that allow them to add their, their major characters. Maybe their major characters are distracted at the moment, occupied either reef outfitting their vessel or on their own secondary quest, but they will really catch up with the mission. Sort of the classic Gandalf, I'm going to send you on this epic quest, but I'm not going to be there most of the time. So I go on, I'm going to flip a, a, a motive. Why does the patron want me to do this? And I flip the sun card. The sun card, if you know anything about the tarot, is a wonderful card. It's a card of, uh, of enterprises and um, good events. The sunrise is always welcomed as a, as a... But for our intensive purposes, we want to make sure that we look at the fact that we have, we have major tarot modifier for motive, because that's what I was flipping for. I was flipping for a card for the actual reason, and let's see what that sun card says. I scroll down the sun card. Now this sun card will only affect the motive. It doesn't go back. Even though there's a sun card that affects the mission, it's not the mission that's being affected by the sun card. So I look at the sun card, and the sun card tells me, star, sun, but it's inverted. The patron was recently promoted or recognized. The recognition was negative. He was discredited or denied promotion uh, to Viscount. So this is definitely adding some elements of intrigue to the whole thing. Uh, I'll, I'll show my father. I'm going to make sure that I complete this mission and that he knows that I am a valuable part of his realm. So our heir to fortune actually had some sort of discredit. Maybe the father um, wanted uh, a, a second son or a daughter to assume the uh, throne. Or maybe this is a daughter that uh, is uh, the first daughter and is now dealing with a younger brother who is the favorite. The patron was recently, as it says, uh, received negative recognition. Now at this point in my, uh, in my climax flow, I have generated a patron quest and the, and the reason why uh, my patron Rogar wants us to go on this quest. But I have, don't really have enough information so far to really put this in my campaign. So I'm going to start to flip some other cards that will help me do that. And we're going to go to our, our actual uh, factions right now.
I go up to the top again because it's easier to work in the uh, PDF with a uh, with the table of contents. And I scroll down a little bit, and I'm looking now for uh, uh, political motive and sinister organizations. And I flipped a ten of coins. So coins are major clans with a no uh, usurpation goals. So the empire is run with a uh, with a classic fantasy overlord who probably is content with his harem and his intrigues in his capital and is letting the frontiers go wild. And this brings opportunity for the players to actually adventure. Uh, this quest might, in fact, take me out to, uh, to Ver or Ryazan. And uh, I just need to decide that as a referee and put given contents. So I've got Roker and my um, longboat and myself. We're going to start with alternate characters and we're going to eventually travel, let's say, to Ryazan. But what did we flip here with that uh, ten of coins? Who secretly behind the scenes is, uh, is interested? Now this is not necessarily a rival, but it's something that's coming about. Now that uh, ten of coins puts me in a position where, and it's inverted, uh, the inverted uh, case in this case uh, uh, tends to suggest the repose of the quest. Uh, the Avar Dwarf, a foul creature, the colony closest to the giant tundra. So let's see if we can locate that on our, on our campaign map. It's a little bit off to the side here. I'll have to open up my campaign a little bit. And it'll show me those Avar Dwarves are over here in this area. I may have to maximize this in order to get to my scroll bars at the bottom. So the Avar Dwarf are all over here. Now why would they be at Ryzen? This may be a situation where I will tell the players, they're only going to Ryzen, but they're actually going all the way out here to where the Avar Dwarf are. So that adds a whole other element to what's going on with the uh, with the situation in the campaign. Do a little housekeeping here, bring my deck back into view. And making sure you can read your chat. And scrolling down a little bit and scrolling back a little bit. And that's where I'll leave it. And we go back to our mission here. So the Avar Dwarf are the ones that are actually... Um, Skype loves to get in the way. It's a beautiful product, but oh gosh, it can be annoying at times. So it's going to be involved perhaps the, the Tundra Giants as well. And uh, these dwarves have some of the richest stockpiles of precious gems. It's a nice little thing. I got a little quote from the uh, Heroes of Asgard from 1870 in here. She drew uh, back with blinded eyes looking upon the necklace. A passionate whisper is forth in her heart to have it for her own. So these are basically the dwarves in Chronicles of the Outlands are the, twi are the tricksters. You're not going to find your friendly Gimli's in your... Uh, although Tolkien also had some flares. Um, had some Norse influence on his dwarves as well. Uh, the Avar Dwarf collectively fight against the goals of the Delver companies and uh, anyone who would basically violate their territories. All right. That tends to suggest that we actually have a mission that may take us into the underworld. I certainly could go back and I could reinterpret my mission card as going into the underworld, or I could flip another card just... Let me have something more specific to the Underworld, and I got a King of Swords. Missions in the Underworld, a King of Swords. I go to the Underworld, King of Swords. That King of Swords, and it is inverted. We're going to rescue some minor rogue or slightly degenerate creature from more powerful forces. Okay, so this is interesting. Maybe uh, our uh, patron Rogar was the one who uh, exiled... Uh, a, uh, a servant of his, a non-human, uh, and non-humans in Outlands, not like non-humans in most fantasy games. You basically can take an animal form and put it on a human body. Let's uh, let's uh, take the animal form of a. Uh, mm, I like a horse, so let's put a horse's head on a human body. And this was a servant of Rogar when he was a younger boy, and uh, or maybe she. Uh, and was sent away into exile with the Avar Dwarves. So the mission is starting to shape up that we're going to rescue that person from exile and from captivity among the Avar Dwarves. But we still have... Let me see if I can uh, cut and paste that out for my own record keeping. 
And we still have the fact that we now generated some, and let's find out what the patron's finance is. That's a card. I get the uh, Seven of Rods. Seven of Rods. Back to my table of contents here. Scroll down a little bit. And I get into uh, finances. Finances, Seven of Rods. What does the patron have to offer us at the moment? It's inverted. So the Aries garrison, constable, ships, and stores are made available, but it's inverted. The rival is a member of the opposing political party that says no to such expenditures. So Rogar probably is now shaping up even more. Rogar is uh, basically his father is the commander of this garrison, and uh, perhaps the rival who we've not named yet. I'll name him Sirt after the giant. And Sirt is the, basically the second in command, maybe the one that's more... Um, um, frugal with the resources of the garrison, yet uh, Rogar has been using his father's garrison more as a plaything, uh, going out to raid or um, ordering the men around. And so the, the rival Cert is basically saying that no, you may not use these uh, um, forces that are available in the garrison, the resources of the garrison. So if the players needed something like uh, supplies for their longboat or uh, a fresh uh, mounts for their servants to ride along, um, this would all be something that would need to be resolved during the quest of play. The finances are more difficulties than they are the actual uh, uh, items, you know, like a chest of coins or um, a certain magic item. We continue on with the twist. What's going to happen during travel encounters? Because most of the time, travel encounters are, are part of the heart of play, especially if you're trying to flip these quests out on the fly. I go into uh, my twists, and I flipped a uh, judgment card. So what... Major Tarot, Judgment card, is the unfathomable that has affected this quest. So I go to the Judgment, and the Judgment says that, and you notice as well that we got that sun earlier. And what's nice about the cards is the fact that uh, unless I flip the Wheel of Fortune, they're not going to reshuffle. So that sun card is not going to be what's going to affect our twist. This judgment card, which came up at it when it did, was not something that affected the patron. The cards will certainly have an order, but it also means that a certain card, when it comes into play, is not going to be a card that's yet to be played. So some of the more ridiculous combinations, like the richest man in the world being totally penniless, um, are not going to are are going to be highly unlikely that they're going to happen. If the person is a captain of the guard, he's probably going to have uh, soldiers with him. He's not going to generate a card that says you will not have soldiers on this quest. There are exceptions, but I took the time and I went through the deck and tried to make some of these things that are a little bit more stretching the imagination. Uh, and uh, made them highly unlikely. So if the card deck, after you flip, it seems like it's got a good progression and works as an orderly advancement, I uh, trust the fact that some you know, chicanery and some effort was taken behind the scene to make sure that this uh, you know, entire deck of cards <laughs> may be utilized and uh, has its own role to play. But let's go to that judgment. So the patron's exact motives or the true consequences of a successful tra uh, quest, if truly no, will anger or sadden the players. But we're on the inverted here. During encounters of the scenarios, players will be unable to control their greed. So something about this quest, and maybe it's related to the Avar Dwarves, as that uh, one little passage suggested that even the goddess, uh, Norse goddess, could not uh, control her greed. And I'm going to clip that right out and stick that into my uh, scratch pad so that we can uh, have it for reference later. And uh, let's see what's at the bottom here that got interesting. Uh, during encounters, the players will not. They, the group will, f will forge, pillage, and steal, and yet no player will check off his desires for fill ignoble. Uh, in Outlands, the players don't ex advance by experience points, uh, and hopefully you know this if you've uh, uh, actually looked at the game or even owned the game. And uh, they advance by checking off nine ignoble deeds. Uh, they're similar to achievements that are uh, coming out more and more in video games, but um, where achievements are more gee whiz, uh, you, you know, you've slaughtered 8,000 of this type of creature, uh, ignobles are more of the advancement obstacles. After you check off your nine ignobles, you will go up a level. So they will never be satisfied with what they gain, and this, of course, could be a, you know, a source of conflict between the players. It could be a source of conflict between uh, the patron and uh, 
we move on. What do we got left? Let me put my uh, referee reminder here. We've already got our twist. Who's our rival for this quest? Well, we already have the Avar Dwarves, and that was an inverted flip when we flipped them. And I have a three of rods. So once again, I can go to the top of my tables here. And if I go down to three of rods under twists, no, and I could certainly have made a twist in the underworld here. Or wait a second. Yeah, no, I, I, I skipped a step. Uh, thank you for reminding me. That uh, judgment card doesn't end it. That's not the twist. The twist is the actual card that comes up. This is just a modifier. So not only do we have the greed, we have the three of rods here affecting our twist. And since we've really suggested the Avar Dwarves, we could flip. We could uh, take one of these monsters of the underworld. But let's just basically see if we can get a travel encounter as we get to the lands of the Avar. And that three of rods will tell me... I'm going to go down... So not only are we affected by greed on the mission, that an alternate quest will become available during the adventure, a much profitable one. Wow. Okay, so this is going to be a, a, a really good twist. Because not only are the players sort of cursed by their own greed as they move on this quest, but suddenly there'll be many people along the quest who will be seemingly offering them alternatives to leave their patron behind and accept other quests that seem to be more profitable. It won't be the promise of the air that once I become powerful, I'm going to help you out here. It will be, for instance, the um, men of Yaroslav along the way saying that we need you to help us uh, handle a problem with the uh, monkish clerics up here at Staraja. And if you do that, we'll, uh, we'll you know, double the size of your crew or uh, reward you with each with a chest of gold, uh, your weight in gold. Uh, the classic sort of uh, tropes of fantasy. An alternate quest will become available during the course of the adventure, a much more profitable one at the transitions between phases B and C. Travel encounters run in three phases, A, B, and C. At the transition between B and C, the players will be offered a new patron in quest and generate that in its entirety at the time. Now, if the, if the rival who's coming along, he may want to take this alternate quest, so you'd have a quest within a quest, and that very interesting for play. Or he may be left behind and we simply abandon him. And so he's going to become a future person of what happened to that guy, that uh, heir to a fortune that we left behind. Maybe nothing will ever come from, uh, come from it, but the, the deck itself will tend to generate, not even on this quest, but on a quest four, five, six from now, where suddenly that uh, that uh, man who we abandoned as a patron might come back as a rival. Or we may have to just stomach the fact that we make a deal with uh, Roger. Then, you know, are we honorable enough to keep that deed? Or are we ignoble enough knowing that we could check and move on to a second quest and uh, leave this uh, kid and his problems behind trying to uh, recover his, uh, his friend, uh, his non-human horse-headed friend. But now let's get to the actual rival. And we got ourselves an Empress card at three. So once again, lots of uh, lots of uh, flare cards have come in. That Empress card is coming up. So we go to our table of contents here, and I go to my uh, I go to uh, moving down, moving down. I've gotten past my flares, and I'm going to get a uh, rival, a broaden and flesh out the major tarot. And the th Empress says that the person, our cert, and it's not inverted, uh, a person is a relative of another pick who. So we could pick a who card. We could get, for instance, a six of swords. And cert. Now, if you have this in front of you, you know, or you could just basically scratch pad the information as, as, it, comes up, as it comes up. If I play around the table, it's you know I tend to make it a social thing, and we can all, uh, all the players can see the cards as they're flipped, and they can offer their own suggestions. They can tie them back into their characters. Oh, remember that adventure I had when I was only level two, and I had that uh, that guy that uh, was great comic relief. Maybe he is uh, sobered up over time, and he's back in it now. But uh, I go back to my rivals' forces. I'm trying to flip that six of rods and find out a who, and I can answer where and what and why, but I want to answer who, and I've got a six of rods, a uh, beleaguered frontier lords, and six of, uh, excuse me, not six of rods, six of swords, so I got uh, epic adversaries. Now, that's not always <laughs> nice to have. So Surt is actually related to six of swords, 
I moved down. Six of Swords, a Sultanic Crater. And that actually works out really well in the campaign, uh, funny enough, because the Nomadic Warlords are very close to the Avar Dwarves here. So the rival... Once we get to the end of the climb, uh, the end of travel encounters across the frontier and reach uh, the area where we're probably going to have our climax in the tundra up here, there may be even more forces available to the rival from this uh, Sultanic Raider. Let me uh, go ahead and uh, and clip that out. Now it is inverted, so uh, we do have. Uh, we do have the fact that it's also the matchless Delver, and with the dwarves involved, um, you know, Del uh, Delvers are your professional uh, underworld explorers. So there's no right or wrong answer as you do this. If something sparks the imagination, you certainly could skip a card, or you could add extra cards. But let's find out who our actual rival is. And we got ourselves the Tower of Destruction. Boy, that is a card that makes people jump with fear. And myself included. So let's see how bad this is going to be. Our rival is going to have, uh, again, the easiest way for me to get scroll for this text. I miss paper books, but I understand how expensive, you know, these, this is a $5 product. If I had to print it out as a real product, I'd be selling to you for $120. And only a few people would have it, the collectors who want to sell it 15 years from now. Let's go on to that... Uh, that flesh out uh, major tarot rival who and you go down to the tower of destruction and it says that uh, the person is about to have his role change uh, he is about to be demoted in prison or sent in the exile now remember we said that cert was the actual uh, subordinate in the uh, in the garrison perhaps when the father finds out that the uh, uh, that uh, Sirt allowed his son to go out without his usual escort because Sirt was uh, second in command was not allowing the resources of the garrison um, he, he got mad and fired him. So now Cert is pursuing the, the player, not necessarily as a rival uh, to oppose the quest, but as a rival who wants to get Rogar and bring him back to his father safely. He doesn't want him to go all the way to the Avar Tours. Well, that's, you know, that's, that's a ridiculous thing. You, who knows if you're a companion from uh, a childhood. It even exists. It's like a kid who wants to go find his Velveteen Rabbit here. And uh, um, it's inverted. Uh, isn't inverted. Actually, it's not inverted, so I need to sometimes do a double check. Uh, and But if it was inverted, uh, he's about to be called to a tribunal before the gods. That is definitely a fantasy thing. But in this case, he's basically going to be set into exile, and he's going to actually go and find uh, uh, Rogar. And that's, uh, you know, if I had sat down 30 minutes ago before I started flipping cards here and said, well, I want a quest. I might have come up with an heir, and I might have said that he's going to go into the underworld against the dwarves, and I might have said, well, uh, you know, that's going to affect uh, uh, this part of the campaign where he's going to sort of cheat and lie, saying, well, I just need you to take me as far as Ryzen, and then, and I might even say, well, uh, and then when the players are faced with the fact that when they get the rise and the patron wants them to continue on, that there's no way they're even completed their quest yet, they may decide to just say a deal's a deal, we're done and we're out of here. But the fact that that card came up and told me that the, uh, that the second in command of the fortress, the garrison, was upset by the father, uh, or was uh, the father was upset and sent him back out to recover his son, that probably would not have come to me. And that's what's nice about the deck, is they're essentially, I'm using them as well as just something to stimulate the imagination. And with the details that you can generate here, you're going to get some some wickedly splendid combinations, as I would say. But let's see who that rival actually is. And we just flipped the hangman. Now, did I, uh, did I grab that to keep my... Make sure I keep all of my text I'm generating here in case I want to use this actual mission on my players. And I go back to this and I just flip to Hangman, so I'm going to go up to Hangman. Uh, and it's uh, it's not inverted because the man is actually hanging upside down. And the person is just a relative of the patron. Ah, okay, that makes a lot more sense as well. Let's make him a little distant on, uh, distant. Uh, uh, an uncle is not really that distant, but he could be. So Cert is related to Rogar. That's another twist, or another um, I flesh out of the patron, that uh, flesh out of the rival that I would not have added as detail. You know, if I had just been sitting down to try to write this, if I wanted to write a fantasy novel, I would want all of these different combinations. But if I'm trying to make a fantasy game, 
Um, again, it's easier just for me to flip the cards and see what comes up. And I finally get the Knight of Cups. So to finish this all up and give me my Knight of Cups, because I'm going to say it's a low-level quest. I don't need any necessary flare forces, although I'll show them to you. I go back up to the table of contents because, as I've said many times, it's just easier for me to uh, reference it that way. And I'm the rival himself is going to be Knight of Cups. Flare forces? No. Who? Who? Cups? And Knight? And it's not inverted? And <laughs> it's interesting. We got ourselves a monster hunter. So not only is Cert uh, someone who is extremely capable in the campaign, he has allies, either of the Delvers or the uh, uh, nomadic warlords. In fact, he may have been, you know, the son of a nomadic warlord. Um, he has hosted and feasted uh, with the Janissary. His home is a museum of the abnormal. The uh, noble governs the city of Chernigrov. So I could say that the rival actually, you know, assert is a, um, is a son uh, on a parallel path, but he would be from the, uh, the town of uh, Chernigrov. Now, again, a lot of the stuff I put in here is specific to my mission, uh, on my campaign. You can... Uh, and these campaign maps are within the game book itself. But if you want to uh, generate these for your other uh, favorite roleplay game, you certainly don't need to uh, to use every aspect, especially if you don't have a, a Chernigov in there. But you're you know you're smart enough. Trust your instincts. You can basically know that you know if if you're saying that the person in this case is from this town right here. So we're going to take, uh, we're going to go from Constantinople, and we're going to go across the Black Sea, and we're going to take rivers up to uh, to this way to Ryzen, and when we get there, we realize we have to go further on, and we're going to have to come back down, or we're going to have to come back around. Eventually, Chernigov may be a place that we actually need to cross over. And this would happen as well, that this person is related to the governor of that area. So that's going to be a very dangerous place to move through as the players. Maybe uh, he's going to send word to his... Um, uh, father there, or his uh, brother there, whoever he has uh, connections with there, had to uh, stop the party, stop the longboat from traveling past Kernigov. So that's going to add another set of encounters where we're going to have to fight to either uh, move our uh, long, we're going to either have to drag that longboat over land around the city state itself, or we're going to have to try to pass under night, or what's beautiful about a game like Outlands is that the players will have magical techniques where they can basically uh, reroute the river or reconnect the river or mass their boat in some way. And it's all that's all that's the heart of role play. As you generate the mission, you don't want to solve it for the players. You just basically want to present it for the players. So we have our mission and we have our, uh, our patron and our rival. I told you that I would flip a card for uh, twists just to give you a demonstration of that. Let me see what our twist would be. And then 10 of rods, so I can come down here and, uh, you know, let's see if it's going to be the icing on the cake, as the cliche would be. Rivals forces, uh, right here, flare forces, a 10 of rods, and I go down to the 10 of rods, and 10 of rods tells me that uh, the goblin bombards, the enemy has defensive long-range cannons, some weighing over 100 tons. That would be something that would be added uh, easily into Chernigov. So even though the players come up with the idea that they can um, uh, move their boat over land or uh, reroute the river or connect, you know, when they enter a portal on, on the southern side of Chernigov to get to the northern side of Chernigov, um, the goblin cannons could be hitting them, you know, all the way up to uh, Verbitsk or down to Kiev. And uh, again, if, uh, you know, these are, uh, Outlands has a uh, more of a trickster element to it where uh, early firearms are being introduced into the campaign by the goblins. If that's not the flair of your campaign, if you have a, a more classical uh, Tolkien style campaign without firearms, you would just, you know, say that it was a, like a Sauron summoning, summoning the storms to close the passes in the mountains. These are all things that, uh, you know, as a referee, you can adapt to your campaign. To me, what's uh, very magical about the the whole process was the fact that I'm generating I'm generating events with the deck and um, combinations with the deck that I would either have to struggle with and spend several hours, several days thinking about the quest before I even present it. And uh, my players may be coming over in 20 minutes after they had already played all night. If you got that luxury when you're in high school. Or if you got that luxury like me when 
you're retired and you have people online that you game with. And uh, those players online, they're they're thirsty. They're thirsty for adventures. They want to, they want to see their characters develop. And as a referee, um, I, having a practical aid like this is just a wonder. So let me uh, let me recap of at least what I did. I can um, see if I get my. You guys can hold me to my memory. So we have a patron. The patron was Roger, and Roger wanted us to undergo a quest. His boyhood friend. Uh, that he actually uh, got rid of and felt bad about uh, was captured by uh, the Avar Dwarves. He finds out there's that Skype trying to impose itself again. So we're going to head all the way to the Volgar Dwarves. Of course, he may not tell us that originally. He may say that we're only going to Ryazan, and then from there, maybe he's going to take the, uh, the portal on my campaign map that connects the rivers here and here. And that would be another magical event that the players could look at and say, wow, I can check something nobles for that, going through something that. I've always wanted to do that. Um, the governor of Chernogov is related to the garrison commander, who is the rival, actual rival Sirt of the mission. Uh, Sirt would not let Rogar have any of the garrison to make this quest. He had to go outsiders and get the players. And uh, later on, the uh, uh, Sirt's uh, actual commander, the father of Rogar, I sent him into exile, saying, there's no way you're going to let my son go out there by himself. How dare you do that? You bring him back or you'll lose all your position. The finances were such that they uh, um, he's an heir to fortune, so later on the finances would come to play. And that's where we got the, uh, we go back to the finances here. We can see that we have that, uh, uh, go too far. We have the situation where uh, um, the cert was not allowing the finances to be used. And uh, we move on to, uh, may not even checked it out. And then we have that alternate quest that's going to come about, that's going to be our twist. It's uh, when we get uh, somewhere like Ryzen, there's going to be forces there that are going to say, we, uh, we have another quest that we want you to perform. I think I also s said maybe it was over here. Yaroslav? Yeah, I think I even mentioned Yaroslav by name as I was going through my narrative. And that they want you to go up to Storage and handle some uh, evil monks there. But uh, the players are going to be faced with a dilemma on whether or not that's what they really want to do. You can notice by my, my campaign map here, the the, uh, the uh, rivers become the roads. And the, the rivers here from uh, the Black Sea uh, can get us to rise and in connection. But if we have to go back through... Chernigov and around up to the top here. That's how you're going to get eventually to Yaroslav in that alternate quest. If the players actually go to Ryzen and agree to go on and go through this uh, portal, they might never reach Ryzen. I, I should say they may never need to go through Yaroslav and never see that alternate quest. And that's another good option that the players actually with their, uh, uh, you know, they're not being railroaded here. They they actually have options on where they can travel and what what might encounter in the way. These are almost just like chess pieces you're putting down on your on your grand campaign, and will they run into them or not? So we have uh, the Sultanic Raiders, or in this case, a Matchless Delver will be in the Avar area, and that could come into play. It could be a a person that Sir can recruit to help um, uh, find uh, uh, Rogar. And even help uh, rescue uh, Rogar from the uh, from the dwarven captives, but all this was generated with uh, simple flips of the deck of cards, and uh, that's what you get with uh, Chronicles of the Outlands, uh, adventure after adventure, just by flipping the cards. <laughs>